Hi, this is John Whitaker for the Mathematical Analysis 1 class, and this is our video lecture uh, number 7. And we were talking about complex numbers and properties of complex numbers and working with uh, conjugates of complex numbers. And we had left off last time on the fact that we had uh, several parts to a proof of one part, and I'm going to pick up there. And so uh, here was the fact. So it said, uh, if Z and W are complex numbers, uh, then we have the following. The first part was that if you take the conjugate, if you take Z plus W and then it's conjugate, that's equal to the conjugate of z plus the conjugate of w. And that's something we proved. B, that z times w, you multiply that together and then take its conjugate, that's equal to z uh, conjugate times w conjugate. C, z plus z conjugate is equal to two, is equal to two times the real part of z. And then another part of that is z minus uh, z conjugate is equal to 2i times the imaginary part of z. And part d, it says that z times z conjugate is, a real, is real and positive. Except when z equals to zero, uh, and in that case, uh, that that's going to be equal to zero. And we've done part A, so we want to do uh, proofs of part B, C, and D. So proof, we're going to let z be equal to so a plus bi and uh, w be equal to c plus di. And part a, uh, we've done this. So part b, what we want to do is uh, we want to show that z times w conjugate is equal to z conjugate times w conjugate. That's what we want to show. Okay. All right. Uh, so here, note that z times w conjugate is equal to a plus bi times c plus di, the conjugate of that, and that's going to be equal to, well, we'll do our multiplication. This is AC uh, minus BD plus, it's AD plus BC times I, which is the conjugate of that. And that's equal to AC minus BD minus AD uh, plus BC. Ah, so that's what z times uh, uh, w is conjugate is equal to. Now, if we look at uh, z conjugate times w conjugate, that's going to be equal to a minus bi times uh, c minus bi. And if we multiply that together, that's going to be ac and then it's still going to be minus BD. So the, you take this guy times this guy, and it's minus in both cases. So you do the positive, but you have to subtract them. That's that. And then it is uh, minus ADI. And here is, if you will, uh, a minus BCI, which is equal to, so it's AC minus BD.
Here I think of a mistake. I don't know why I had I there. It should be BD. If you look down the I by mistake. This is AC minus BD. And here this is going to be minus, and it will be AD plus BC times I. And you see those two things are exactly the same. So that shows that those two quantities are the same. Let me write that conclusionary statement up. So that means that uh, Z times W conjugate is equal to Z conjugate times W conjugate. So that's part B. Now for part C, what we want to show is two things. Um, we want to show, and this is like part one, so we want to show that z plus z conjugate is equal to 2 times the real part of z. Well, note that z plus z conjugate, this is very simple, is equal to a plus bi times a uh, plus uh, A minus B I, and then uh, that's going to be equal to, here, that's going to be 2A, and the plus B I and the minus B I cancels, and A is the real part of Z, where Z is equal to A plus B I, so that's equal to 2 times the real part of Z. That's uh, the first part of the statement, C proven. And here, for the second part, we want to show, so here we want to show that Z minus Z conjugate is equal to 2I times the imaginary part of Z. That's what we want to show. And so here, we note that Z minus Z conjugate is equal to A plus BI uh, minus A minus BI, and that's equal to, well, it's A minus A, uh, and then plus BI uh, plus BI, and that's equal to 2BI. The 2i, we can pull out, and b is the imaginary part of z, so that's what we we'll put in its place, and that's the proof of part c. Now, we want to prove part D, and what that is, is that we want to show that Z times Z conjugate is a positive real number. Z equal to zero, and in that case, we'll show Z times Z conjugate is equal to zero. But uh, here, note that Z times Z conjugate uh, is equal to uh, Z, well, it's equal to A plus BI times A minus BI. And so uh, what that's equal to is it's equal to uh, a uh, times a, that's a squared, and then it would be minus a minus b times b. 
and then plus it would be uh, would be minus a b i, and then here is a plus a b i, uh, and so that ends up yielding a squared plus b squared, and then this is zero, so that's what we get. And so uh, if z is different from zero, then that means that either a uh, is different from zero, or one of these has to be the case, b is different from zero. So that says that uh, z times z uh, conjugate, which equals to a squared plus b squared, is going to be greater than zero in this case, if z is different from zero. So you see uh, that z times z conjugate is a real number being squared plus a real number being squared. That's a real number, add them together, you get a real number, and it's going to be greater than zero. So, so if it's different from zero, we get that z times z uh, conjugate is a positive real number. Here, I'm just going to say this as a comment. If z is equal to uh, 0, which equals to 0 uh, plus 0 i, then z times z conjugate equals to uh, a, which is 0 squared, plus b, which is 0 squared, which equals to 0. So it's a real number as well, but it's equal to 0 in this case. And that's the proof of the theorem. The next thing that I want to do is uh, uh, state a fact that's going to be useful to us a little later. I won't prove this fact, but here's what it is. It says for every real number x greater than zero and every integer n greater than zero. Here we're talking about natural numbers. There is one and only one positive real solution or real y such that y to the n is equal to x. There's only one real answer. Real positive answer to that equation. Next thing I'm going to do is give a definition having to do with the absolute value of z or modulus of C. Okay. Here's the definition. It says, let Z uh, be a complex number. Absolute value or absolute value of C. Sometimes it's called modulus of C, is denoted by Z inside bars, inside absolute values is the non-negative
square root of z times z conjugate. That is z is equal to z times z conjugate all raised to the one half power. Or if you take the modulus of z and square it, you get z times uh, z conjugate. And remember, this was a positive number, and so you can see from our uh, particular fact, there's only um, this real number. It is non-negative, but it's a real number, z times z conjugate is. And so when you look at this quantity right here, uh, there's only one uh, positive answer for this, only one real positive answer for this by our uh, previous fact. So that's the way we're defining uh, <clears throat> the modulus or absolute value of a complex number. Let's do just one quick example. So, uh, of complex numbers. So, if we let Z and W be elements of the complex numbers, and then we have the following facts. Part A, the modulus of Z is greater than zero unless Z equals to zero, and in this case, the modulus of zero is equal to zero. B, uh, the, the absolute value of z conjugate is equal to the absolute value of z. C, the absolute value of z times w is equal to the absolute value of z times absolute value of w. D, that the absolute value of the real part of z is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of z. And E, the absolute value of z plus w is less than or equal to the absolute value of z plus the absolute value of w. Uh, that's called the triangle inequality. This is known as the triangle inequality. All right, uh, so we want to prove these facts. So, prove we're going to let z and w be elements of complex numbers, and we'll let, for our notation, we're going to let z be equal to a plus bi, and w be equal to c plus di. And then, uh, the first thing for part one, or part A, uh, we want to show that 
That's the value of z is greater than zero if z, so this is kind of part one here, if uh, z is different from zero. So we let z be different from zero. Now the absolute value of z is equal to z times z bar uh, raised to one half power. That's the square root of a squared plus b squared. And since, i uh, treat this back, uh, z is different from zero, uh, a squared plus b squared is greater than zero. So that says that the square root of a squared plus b squared is greater than zero. So the absolute value of z is greater than zero. And if z did equal to zero, then the modulus of z would be equal to uh, the square root of a squared plus b squared. But we've shown that each one, well, we're assuming that each one of a and b are, uh, is zero, so that's the square root of zero, which equals to uh, zero. So that's part a. Okay. For part B, we want to show that the absolute value of z conjugate equals to the absolute value of z. And so uh, here we'll note that the absolute value of z is going to be equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. Now, um, the absolute value of z conjugate is equal to um, z conjugate times, or, well that would be, yeah, z conjugate times z conjugate's conjugate, okay, raised to the one half power. Now z conjugate will be equal to a minus bi, the conjugate of that is a plus bi raised to the one half power. And that's going to be equal to uh, the square root of a squared plus b squared. So that says that uh, z conjugate's absolute value is equal to z. For part c, what we want to show is We want to show that the absolute value of z times w is equal to the absolute value of z uh, times the absolute value of w. So here, let's note that if you take a look at z times w, absolute value of that squared, uh, that's going to be equal to, well, it's going to be equal to uh, a plus bi times uh, c plus di times I don't think I have very much room here. Let me write this a little bit lower. So this is A plus B I times C plus D I. And now the conjugate of that. So it will be um, times. And the conjugate.
conjugate of emulfication is the emulfication of conjugate. So this is A minus DI times C minus DI. And by reassociating and commutativities for uh, complex numbers being uh, a field, what we get that th this is equal to A plus DI times uh, A minus DI um, and then times C plus DI times C minus DI. And this is nothing more than um, Z times Z conjugate times, this is W times W conjugate, which we can rewrite as Z squared. Uh, the absolute value of Z being squared times the absolute value of W being squared. Okay, that's what we have. So, um, uh, note, if either uh, z or w equals or is zero, is zero, then z times w will be equal to, to, to zero because z times w, that's the value of z times w. Z will be equal to zero. Because Z times W, if one of those is zero, then when you multiply them together, you're going to get zero, and the uh, modulus of zero, zero, we've already shown that. Uh, and the absolute value of Z times the absolute value of W, well, if one of those is zero, then these are going to be real numbers, and if one of uh, the Z or W is zero, then the absolute value of one of them is going to be zero, so we get zero. If Z is different from zero and W is different from zero, then that fact about the real numbers um, uh, says uh, the one that I did not prove. says that uh, z times w is going to be equal to absolute value z times absolute value w. And that is that proof. Okay. Uh, for the next part, part D, um, we want to show that the absolute value of the real part of Z is less than or equal to Z. Okay, so here's what we note. The real part of Z inside absolute value is the absolute value of A. And that's equal to the square root of A plus 0i times A uh, minus 0i. Which is equal to the square root of A squared.
Okay, and um, now the modulus of z is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. Okay, um, since um, a squared is less than or equal to uh, a squared plus b squared, and uh, the square root function is an increasing function. Then the square root of a squared has to be less than or equal to square root of a squared plus b squared. And so here, uh, that gives us that the absolute value of the real part of z is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of z. Well, that's that part. We only have one more part to do. That's part E. And uh, that's the triangle inequality. So for part E, we want to show that the absolute value of Z plus W is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of Z plus the absolute value of W. Well, um, what I'd like for us to uh, look at first is to note that uh, z times, I'm sorry, z conjugate times w will be equal to a minus bi times c plus bi, which is going to be equal to, so this is ac, and it would be plus bd in this case, Plus, here we're going to have AD minus BC times I. Let's read that. And now, if we look at Z times W conjugate, that's going to be equal to A plus BI times C minus BI. And that's going to be equal to AC and it would be plus BD, and then it would be uh, mm, plus, if you will, uh, a minus AD plus BC times I. Okay, okay. so, this is multiplication. If you take Z conjugate times W plus um, Z times W conjugate, what you're going to get, so when I'm adding this quantity and this quantity together, uh, you see that you get 2 times AC plus BD, uh, which equals to 2 times the real part of Z times W conjugate. That's what you can say, one way you can say it. Okay, that's an interesting observation. It's going to be a helpful observation for us. Okay, now, if we look at the absolute value of z plus w to b squared, what that's going to be equal to is z plus w times uh, z plus w's conjugate. 
And we have shown in a previous fact about uh, uh, conjugates that this is going to be equal to z plus w times z conjugate plus w conjugate. So the conjugate of an addition is the addition of the conjugates. And then if we multiply this out, uh, and what we have um, using the distributive property, if you will, this is z times z conjugate uh, plus z times w conjugate plus w times z conjugate plus w times w conjugate. Okay. okay, this first part is equal to the absolute value of z to b squared plus this is two times, and again, these two quantities are exactly what we looked at in the first part of the proof of part E, and it was equal to two times the real part of Z times W conjugate, and this is plus W squared. Okay. Now, um, this is going to be less than or equal to Z modulus being squared plus two times uh, the absolute value of z times w conjugate uh, plus w squared. Uh, and this is because the real part of z times w is uh, less than the absolute value of the real part, uh, less than or equal to the absolute value of the real part of z times w. And that's uh, less than or equal to uh, the absolute value of z times, I should be saying w conjugate. That's what we have. And so this is equal to the absolute value of z squared plus 2 times the absolute value of z times the absolute value of w. That's a property we just proved. Plus the absolute value of w squared. And this is equal to absolute value of z um, well it's absolute value of z squared plus 2 times absolute value of z times absolute value of w because absolute value of the conjugate of w is equal to the absolute value of w plus absolute value of w squared and you can see there's something here uh, where you can factor that So indeed, it does factor. And so what we have is um, the absolute value of z plus w to b squared is going to be less than or equal to uh, the absolute value of z plus the absolute value of w um, to b squared. Now since the absolute value of z plus w is going to be greater than or equal to zero, and the absolute value of z and the absolute value of w are greater than zero, so this addition is greater than or equal to zero, I should say. Uh, <clears throat> then um, we can take the square root of both sides, and it implies that z plus w is going to be less than or equal to uh, the absolute value of z plus the absolute value of w as the square root. an increasing function and so it maintains its inequality and that's what we have and that ends that proof the last thing that I want to do today is called Schwartz inequality and it's going to be a uh, lengthy proof with kind of a simplified uh, notation involved, but sometimes the notation being simplified can help, uh, and uh, not help, but uh, uh, 
and induce us losing track of what we're looking at. But anyway, uh, before I write down the Schwarzenegger uh, inequality, let's first of all have some notation listed. Here's what it says. It says, if x1 up to xn are complex numbers, and this is a notation that's going to be familiar to you, then if you have x1 plus x2 plus, keep adding till you get to xn, that could be represented by the sum as uh, j runs from 1 to n of xj. Just the sigma notation for addition. Okay. We're now ready for the Schwartz inequality. Its statement and its proof, and here it is. It says if a one, a two, all the way up to a n, and B1, B2, all the way up to Bn are complex numbers. Then the absolute value of the sum as J runs from 1 to n of Aj times Bj conjugate. That to be squared is going to be less than or equal to the uh, sum as the j's run from 1 to n of the absolute values of the aj's to be squared times the sum as j runs from 1 to n of the bj's inside absolute values to be squared. So each one of the Absolute values are being squared in each one of the sums. Okay? So that's where we are. That's the statement. And so uh, here's some kind of notation to help us, hopefully. Start the proof. And what we're going to start off with is we're going to let A be equal to this first sum on this right hand side. So it says, uh, I'll write it down with uh, J running from 1 to N of. Uh, the absolute value of aj to b squared. We're going to let b be the second sum, so it's j minus from 1 to n, the absolute values of b sub j to b squared. And we're going to let c be the sum as uh, j runs from 1 to n of aj times bj conjugate. And the first thing we'll say is, we're going to have two cases. The two cases whether if B is zero or not. Okay, so this part, this part is zero or not. So if B equals to zero, then what that says, the only way that this sum could be equal to zero, uh, remember we're summing up positive, uh, or summing up non-negative uh, answers here, non-negative quantities. So only it can be zero, so each thing we're adding up has to be zero. And uh, so for each one of these guys to be equal to zero, that would say that B1 would equal to B2, which would be equal to all the way up to Bn, and it would all be zero.
So, um, what that would say then, does uh, C, which was equal to the sum of the AJ times the uh, BJ conjugates. You see, the BJs would all be zero, and so that means that the BJ conjugates are all zero. And so when you take zero times AJ, you're going to get zero because that, uh, the complex numbers are a field. And so you're summing up zeros. And so that's the C, and that's zero. Uh, and A times B equals to zero. So that means that the statement is true. If uh, B equals to zero. So that's the first case. And the second case is, uh, what if B isn't zero? So, if for not B zero, if you look back for a second, what B is defined to be over here? Okay. <clears throat> We're adding up non-negative quantities. So uh, it's either zero or it's positive. So if B is not zero, that means that B, the only other case, is that B had to be greater than zero. Then we're going to look at this uh, quantity. So note, uh, if you take the sum as I runs from 1 to N of B, a times A sub I minus C times B sub I, and you take its absolute values and you square it and you sum that up. Okay, so what is this equal to? This is equal to the sum, as I runs from 1 to N, this would be B A I uh, minus C B uh, I times the uh, it's conjugate. Okay. So the conjugate is. Now, B is a real number. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's conjugate. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, well, let me write this down. It's BAI minus CBI conjugate. And now we'll simplify it. Okay. Look, the, the conjugate of an addition was the conjugate of each part. The same holds true for subtraction. So it's going to be the conjugate of this guy uh, minus the conjugate of this guy. Now, the conjugate of B B is a real number, so it's conjugate is itself. So we're just going to have uh, the conjugate of the AIs there. And C, now C was um, something that might be real, might not be real, uh, might be imaginary. So uh, its conjugate is uh, going to be uh, needed there. And then uh, the conjugate of BIs is going to be needed. So <clears throat> what we get... is this is equal to the sum as I runs from 1 to N of B A I minus C B J times, it's going to be B times A, this is uh, I, so I'm sorry, I made a mistake. B uh, times A conjugate minus C conjugate times B I conjugate. That's what we have. Now, um, here when we multiply this out, we can break this sum up. So we're going to have the multiplication and sums uh, here. So this is I run from one end. This is going to be uh, B squared times AI times AI constant. Um, I guess I'll write down the one sum. And then it's going to be minus uh, B times C conjugate 
times AI times BI conjugate. And then it's going to be minus uh, C uh, B uh, times AI times conjugate times BI. And then finally, we're going to have plus uh, C times C conjugate uh, times uh, BI times BI conjugate. Okay. I don't know if that showed up very well. Let me write it down underneath. That was equal to uh, the, it was plus, excuse me, plus uh, C times C conjugate uh, times BI times BI conjugate. That, that's what we have. And this can be broken up into four sums. I'll do that. So it's the sum as I run from 1 to n of the b squared ai, ai conjugate uh, minus the sum of the b times c conjugate, ai, bi conjugate. And then this is minus the sum as i runs from 1, every time as i runs from 1 to n, of the cb. AI conjugate BI, and then plus one more sum here. As I runs from 1 to n of C times C conjugate BI times BI conjugate. Okay, we're going to finish this proof. So, in that first sum, the B's do not, uh, the big B, does it uh, uh, depend on I, so it's a constant, so it can be pulled out. So, uh, this is nothing more than b squared times the sum as i runs from 1 to n of ai times ai conjugate minus, again we pull out the constant, b uh, times c conjugate of the sum of the a i b i conjugate, i runs from 1 to n, and then uh, minus cb Pulled out, we have again a sum as i runs from 1 uh, to n of a i conjugate times b i. And then plus, here that last sum had c times c conjugate. That's nothing more than the absolute value of c to be squared, which can be pulled out. And then the sum, and then it's b uh, uh, times, well, I'll write it down. It's bi times bi conjugate. Well, that, that's equal to, this is the sum as i runs from 1 to n. That's equal to, this is b squared times the sum of the ai's as i runs from 1 to n to b squared. Mm -hmm. And then this is minus bc conjugate uh, times. Uh, I'll leave it as long as sum as i runs from 1 to n of the ai bi conjugate minus cb times the sum as i runs from 1 uh, to n of ai bi conjugate. And then this is plus, this is the absolute value of c to be squared. And here's the sum as i runs from 1 to n of the bi's absolute values to be squared. Okay, so that's where we are. Okay. So, uh, substituting in some symbolism that we've already established in this proof, what we get is that that's equal to, okay, so it's b squared 
Uh, this was times, uh, this was A, minus B times C conjugate, the sum as I run from 1 to N of AI, BI conjugate, uh, and then this is minus CD times the sum as I run from 1 to N of AI, BI conjugate, and then plus... This was the absolute value of C to B squared. And then this was nothing more than B. That's where we are. Okay. Now, this is going to be equal to B squared times A plus, I'm sorry, it says minus, B C conjugate, and right here, this was what uh, C was. Okay, that's what C was. This is minus CB, and what this is going to be is the conjugate. This sum right here is the conjugate of C, so C conjugate, and then plus, here's the absolute value of C to B squared times B. That's that last part. Okay. Well, uh, these are... Uh, the exact same thing. Um, and as a matter of fact, it's b squared times a minus b, and c conjugate times c is the absolute value of c to b squared, minus, again, we have the same thing. And here's plus 1 over. Okay, so that can be simplified as b squared a uh, minus b times the modulus of C squared. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that's what that original quantity was. What was that original quantity? So that first thing we looked at, oops. <clears throat> so since that first sum that we said to look at, the sum as I run from 1 to N of B A I minus C B I squared, since that is going to be greater than or equal to, uh, well, well, this is what we have. I'm sorry, let me back up just a little bit. So that quantity, what we looked at, is going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to that B, let me just rewrite, B squared A minus B times C, uh, absolute value of C to B squared. You can put factor out of B there, and then you have B, times A minus uh, absolute value of C to B squared. Okay, that's what we have. Okay, so that was the original quantity we looked at. And so, uh, since this quantity has got to be greater than or equal to zero, then uh, we have that B times B A minus uh, the, mo uh, the modulus of C B squared, that has to be greater than or equal to zero. And uh, since B was greater than zero, that was the assumption in this case, then that means that B A minus C squared had to be greater than zero. So that says that B A uh, has to be greater than, and this was not greater than, greater than or equal to, has to be greater than or equal to uh, the modulus of C to B squared. But that is the statement, just in terms of those symbols A, B, and C that we were trying to prove. Let me write that down and 
So that's it. So that says uh, that the sum as I run from 1, I think I wrote it in terms of J, J runs from 1 to N of uh, absolute values of A to J squared times the sum as J runs from 1 to N of the absolute values of BJs to B squared. It's going to be greater than or equal to uh, that C, which was the absolute value of B squared, which is sum as uh, J runs from 1 to N of AJ, BJ conjugate to B squared. And that was the proof. Okay, we've gone over. So thank you very much for your time and patience.